Cool, right. Uh, we're going to do things a little differently today. Uh, normally, I would have these videos scripted and I'll film in front of a nice background or something, but uh, this is the ease where I can do it. Um, I was at the Joel Turner Shot IQ seminar just a few days ago. Um, I've taken a few notes and I thought I'd share what I learned from the course. Uh, and if you have been to a Shot IQ seminar or workshop in person or the online course, I'm curious what you learned and uh, what your thoughts are of the seminar. So post your thoughts in the comments below. But I want to share what I got from the seminar and you can judge whether or not uh, it's worth your time and your money. Um, so as a breakdown of what I'm covering in this uh, session, and I've got a bit of a formalized fancy PowerPoint here, um, I'll go through these uh, topics. So firstly, for those that don't know uh, who Joel Turner is, uh, we'll go through what Shot IQ is, uh, who it's aimed for, what to expect if you do this course or to, uh, do the seminar, uh, and what I personally learn uh, from this experience. A uh, uh, quick disclaimer, uh, this is actually is not a paid promotion. Uh, you would think someone like me might be invited to these things and uh, be a guest. Uh, I actually didn't know about this till about a week ago. Um, so I paid my way in. Uh, I bought my ticket, which was uh, 375 Australian dollars, which is about 300 US dollars, about the same price in the US for the American seminars. Um, so I paid for my ticket. Um, I actually came incognito. Um, I was part of the thumb shooter group uh, in Melbourne. Melbourne and Sydney, so there's a large traditional Ottoman archery contingent which came to both sessions last weekend. Um, in fact, I don't think Joel uh, realized who I was until after the session. We had dinner together and that's when we networked. Um, so I wasn't there in any official capacity. I was very much um, an average, uh, below average bare bow shooter getting some coaching advice from Joel. So uh, this isn't like, you know, YouTubers plugging each other. Um, I'm not a paid sponsor. I'm not uh, plugging his course. Uh, this is legitimately what I bought and paid for and what I got out of it. So that's my declaration out there. So uh, firstly, who is Joel Turner? Um, I think a lot of people know who he is. Um, he's one of the biggest names in the archery scene online and uh, in the real world. Uh, but some people might not know who he is or they're kind of skeptical of, say, paying for coaching and services. So um, Joel Turner uh, is a very renowned archer, uh, mostly known for his Shot IQ uh, course and his work on the push. Um, he's mostly a traditional archer, uh, but he does shoot um, compound, he shoots modern bare bow, um, and he is a, comp a competition shooter. Um, you often see him in interviews and podcasts, especially the Joe Rogan uh, podcast, which was where he got a lot of the large audience. And on the personal side, he is a hunter and a police sniper. Now, this is a quite crucial because um, the kind of person you are and your background will expose you to a lot of the uh, attitudes and mindsets, which will dictate how you approach certain activities, including um, archery. Uh, and I found Joel to be a very good character. Um, during this session that I had him with, um, he was confident, determined, and had strong convictions, but he was never aggressive. He never, he would push you to be outside of your comfort zone and to challenge the way you think, but he wouldn't like antagonize you. Now, this is something which is quite good. He's a very good speaker. Um, and judging from his background as, you know, as police and as police trainer, um, this is something which is, comes as authoritative, uh, but not uh, demeaning. Um, and this is someone who literally makes life and death decisions. Um, and this is a crucial factor in the way he uh, encapsulates his shot mentality and something which is different to many presenters in the archery field. Uh, I found that he is very much locked on to being committed to the shot, uh, making the right decisions. Some like me, for example, even though I uh, might arguably have a good archery teacher, I have a high school teaching background, and my background is a lot more supportive, nurturing, encouraging, a bit more positive mindset, but it's a very forgiving field because we're not here to judge people on being right or wrong and making absolute mistakes. Um, and many people who are uh, art representers are also from uh, similar backgrounds where we're not exactly doing life and death things. So Joel approaches this from a different mindset, which I found quite welcoming. Um, not in a like a warm, hey, royal family kind of way, but hey, you pay 
to be told what you're doing wrong sort of thing. And um, I really enjoy that because, you know, once you get past the ego side, um, I think it's really nice to have someone not just lecture you, but also give you that, um, that, 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 that rocket up your ass to make you do the right thing. So I like that part of him. Um, and he's a very good speaker, very confident, very composed. Um, I really enjoyed the way he presented. It really kind of inspired me not just to think about my archery, but also to kind of be a bit more firm on myself as a person and be firmer on the people I coach and teach just to kind of add a bit more urgency to their life. And a lot of the things he teaches will apply to real life as well. Um, he does the shot IQ as the archery, the shooting side, but it's also the turning method, I think it's called, um, which covers the life aspect of the, the, the mindset which he teaches. Um, I also want to do a caveat here. Um, uh, he does shoot thumb draw, by the way. So while he shoots mostly bare bone compound, he does shoot thumb draw. He is familiar with thumb draw concepts. Um, he knows about Khatra, so it doesn't like... Um, romanticized card throughout this magic tool he knows what it's used for he knows how to apply it um he does have a confident thumb draw technique and we've seen videos where he explains how and why he does it um he's not formally trained in thumb draw i think ironically he learned thumb draw off me he mentioned this when we had dinner it's like oh i think i learned off your videos maybe maybe not but uh, he, he learned thumb draw by himself he wasn't taught it so he doesn't follow a particular asiatic style so not ottoman or arab or chinese so he he applies his his mentality and technique with a thumb draw and he does it quite well and I saw him shoot my bow um, he hasn't had he hasn't had much experience in shooting a lot of Asiatic recurves so our time with him gave him a lot of exposure and connections to Asiatic recurves so maybe we'll see more you know horse bows been shot by him um, but he does he is a very confident shot regardless of the bow he uses so uh, that's a big plus there I was quite impressed with it um, he definitely can shoot thumb draw uh, uh, what is so? What is Shot IQ itself? Uh, the basis of Shot IQ is teaching a controlled shooting process, and it really targets what people will call the mental game. And you've all heard this: archery is mostly a mental game, eighty percent, ninety percent, whatever. Um, but what exactly is the mental game? And that's what this course really approaches. This is not really about shooting technique. So it's not a shot process for form. It's not really about um, the physical or technical side of shooting. This is purely the mental side of shooting and arguably the most important one. Um, the shot IQ uh, is mostly for marksmanship. So it can be applied to shooting like firearms. Um, and of course, it can be applied to uh, archery. And as you said before, um, there's a big demand for applying the principles of shot IQ in real life for non-shooting things so there is um, an alternate Turner method uh, where he covers this uh, in the wider scope of life. Uh, Shot IQ is an online course. Uh, I know some of the people who went there in my group did the online course. I haven't, so this, I know what it is. I just haven't done it before. Um, and of course, it runs as in-person seminars. Um, the material overlaps, but there are things that you get in the real-life seminar that you don't get uh, on the online course. Uh, so um, the biggest difference is if you're paying for the, uh, the in-person seminar, you get that immediate validation and feedback, the chance to kind of really challenge and ask questions. Whereas the, the problem with online courses in general is that you don't really know uh, whether you're doing it right. And often when you do an online course, you read a book or whatever, you kind of get partial things, but you often don't have a full understanding of what you're meant to be learning uh, without having an instructor there. So um, there's similar concepts, but you get a bit more from the in-person seminar if you get a chance to work with Joe in person. Now, who is Shot IQ for? Um, Shot IQ, like I said, isn't dependent on in teaching a technique. So it's, you don't need to be a hunter or a compound shooter to benefit from Shot IQ. It is a mentality exercise, a mindset principle, not a technique principle. So it doesn't matter what shot process is or what style you use, um, it benefits anyone who is into shooting sports, uh, firearms or archery. Um, the nature of precision target shooting really emphasizes target shooters, so competition target shooters uh, and hunters, so the people who really um, need to make the shot count. And I find, as someone who shoots competition, mostly recreation these days, um, the I have a new respect for hunters because you have to make the shot count. Like, you only get one shot. And when you only get one shot, you, 
you, you pay a lot more attention to what you're doing uh, compared to a target shooter, which will get multiple chances to shoot. And this uh, one-shot counts attitude is quite uh, central in shot IQ. Um, but the overall uh, goal is to aim this at anyone who wants to improve precision. Now, there is a, perhaps a group of people who might not benefit from this, and that's the people who don't want to be that precise. And this might seem counterintuitive, but there are some people who are really into the idea of instinctive archery. We just want to shoot by feel. I think Joel Turner and Shot IQ are very against shooting by feel. He really pushes the notion that you have to know what you are doing. You have to know what the next shot will be like. There is no guessing. There is no maybe. There is no going by feel you don't trust feeling you've got to know exactly what you are doing so for and in fact one of our um thumb shooters uh he raised the question well what if you're shooting like say instinctively or on a horseback or just for fun then it's basically this isn't for you all right um i think what joel spins it as is if you don't need to shoot like instinctively and uh, the horseback was the example was well you can't really aim from horseback that's more of a visual sighting hand-eye coordination thing but if you have no excuse to want to shoot precisely on target then you need to have a process in place where you should be able to do so so it kind of debunks instinctive goes more towards you can shoot precisely you should shoot precisely that's what to aim for so what do you expect uh, when you do the in-person seminar? Now, uh, ours ran from 9 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. Um, and it start, it's, it's a very casual thing. Like uh, We had a pretty small group, around like 15 people in the session. And there were multiple sessions over multiple days. Um, and it runs um, for, for the whole day. So it starts with some warm-up. Uh, we were at Urban Archery uh, in Melbourne. Um, so it starts with a warm-up. Uh, you shoot in your... It, it had indoor range so we shoot there and um joel will do um uh, some uh, general observations not so much like he doesn't comment he doesn't tell you anything he just watches everyone shoot just get a feel of everybody he meets you learns your name and it's very good learning names very very good as a teacher i'm very impressed uh so he knows your name he knows who you are and it's a very friendly, nice, nice to meet you sort of thing. Uh, so pretty casual, but he likes to kind of get a feel for who's in the workshop and what they want. So uh, after the initial kind of warm up, he'll then get each person in the workshop to shoot uh, and demonstrate by themselves. So even there's like 15 people, it's one person at a time. You get the whole like, who, who's going first sort of thing and people are kind of like chickening out. But of course, um, you know, people will eventually go and take turns and everyone gets a shot. And uh, in this initial individual observation, um, you might have seen him in videos where he kind of really sticks his nose into like right next to your face and kind of watches what you're doing. That's what he does. And um, what he's looking for is not technique. He's not there to nitpick your form or process. He's there to understand how you do it. And uh, he will ask you questions about what are you thinking of? What, what are you saying to yourself? Like, how do you get this? And there's no right answer because the questions being asked aren't things you anticipate. It's like for me, I'm like, oh, I'm going through my shot process. I'm going through my, uh, my, my transfer and hold and expand and follow through. And, but he'll also ask you, but how? How are you doing this? That's what you're doing, but not how you're doing it. So he'll keep on questioning people on exactly what they do. And a lot of people, like, obviously, there's a bit of nerves going on and people don't shoot well. But you actually get people who go through target panic, who go to these seminars, and they exhibit really heavy signs of target panic. They literally, like, they have to release as soon as they see gold and that sort of thing. So um, it, 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 it's a non-judgmental um, interrogation of exactly what you're thinking of. Because it's, it's there to make you feel a bit uncomfortable, to make you think about, am I really thinking about what I'm doing? So that's the initial observation. Um, the, then there's a, a, the, the lecture section, which goes through the shot IQ uh, part, the, the mental process, the mental game. Um, that's the bulk of the uh, first session. And then afterwards, it's individual uh, coaching and practice. Uh, coaching is a bit of a, a misnomer. Um, if you do pay for private lessons, this is where you get the very intense coaching. Um, but as we are a group, um, you don't get that kind of, you know, hour or half hour one on one it's mostly like 5 10 15 minutes depending on each person but what he does is he doesn't let you shoot 
until he confirms that you have a blueprint to your shop process. So he will individually show you something different depending on what you need to know. Um, again, he's not there to fix your form. Um, if there's anything you're doing which is going to cause um, huge problems in your accuracy and your consistency, he'll tell you. Uh, in my case, um, I had issues with back tension, um, so he would remind me, you have got a leaky tension. But he didn't lecture me how to do it. He just assumed I knew how to do it, just make sure I did it. Um, what was more important was my mental process, and he taught me um, particular steps, which I'll share later, on how I adapted my barebow shooting process. So he doesn't let you shoot until he's happy that you have a shot process, a mental process, and that you're able to execute this. It's blueprinted, so you can copy it for the next shot, and then you can go shoot in practice. Um, of course, you know, we end up being very casual afterwards. After like three or four hours of like instruction, you're like, okay, we're watching people shoot one-on-one. -on -one. It's nice to learn. We'll apply, take a break, we'll shoot again. Um, but I think for the whole session, even though it was quite casual for the last two or three hours, um, it was great because we could share amongst each other, talk about what we learned and try to apply it. Um, and of course, we got exhausted by the end because there's a lot of shooting and getting involved. Um, but that's the breakdown of the day. So what did I learn from this section? Um, so the, the there are quite a few things here, and I'm not going to do this a great service. Uh, most of these things are already in his podcast or on the website, so I'm not really taking away from his business, hopefully. So this is a very watered-down version of uh, what I learned. Um, if you've gone through the Shot IQ workshop, you recognize some of these concepts. So uh, the most important thing in all this was the mental game. Um, and this is what I said before about uh, Joel's profession as a police sniper um, and hunter. Uh, and that is the absolute necessity in being committed to the shot. And this is something which I find fault in myself as a person in real life and uh, as an archer, is I give myself chances. And that's good because you have the chance to learn from your mistakes. But you also use it as a crutch. Now, for those who just shot IQ course or the shot IQ quiz, um, there's something called the handwriting test. If, you know, if you've done it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but the, what, what he shared with us was, I think only like five people ever did this test correctly on the first try, because he'll tell you to do this test as if your life depend on it. Of course, we don't take it seriously, we, we screw it up, and oh well, well, we'll fix it later on. But it comes back to tell you that, yeah, but you made multiple mistakes until you got frustrated. And at what point did you finally decide that you were going to do it right? And that was kind of really mind-blowing. A lot of it puts us off our game, it makes us out of our, uh, our comfort zone. And makes us think how how lax we are in our shot process. And I, as a coach, I see this in most people because we treat archery quite uh, casually, uh, recreationally. And um, in fact, I, I'll mention this later, but I, I did train uh, one of my learners the day after just to kind of see how I apply somebody else. And um, it was a really big um, eye-opener for him as well. So you have to commit to the shot. It's like jumping off a cliff. Um, you have to make, at some point, make the decision to go. And if you go through the whole shot process without that commitment from the very beginning, then you will never do a good shot. It's just, you're not there. So he breaks the mental game down to uh, four different steps, and these must be done in order. The first is you have to show determination. You have to go, you have to be motivated, um, you have to do it as if your life depends on it. Every shot is a do or die, and in Joel's case, literally for him, that's his job. Um, but you know, for everybody else, this is like, if you're not determined to execute the best shot of your life for every single shot, then it's not going to be a good shot. You're like there, there is no, I think it will be good, or I guess it will be good. He will ask you when you shoot, what will the shot be like? And of course, most of us don't know. We can't tell, oh, it will hit gold. We will say, I hope it hit gold, and that's not good enough. There is no hope. There is no, I wish it was, or, I hope it is. It is, you have to know exactly what the result will be. You have to know exactly what the process will be. That's all determined. So unless you show that determination from the outset, then you're already on a weak um, platform. 
So once you have that motivation, that urge, the importance, the urgency, the necessity of executing a good shot, you make decisions. And we talk about things like self-talk, which I'll mention later on, the idea that you are deciding to go through the shot every step of the way. Um, that makes you present. Uh, and something which I also coach my students is the idea of being on autopilot. When you go autopilot, your brain shuts down, you go laser mode, you're not there. So while you're holding a bow and shooting an arrow, you're not really there in that space, in that time. So you lose concentration. So you end up doing things which you don't realize you're doing. Like these things lapse. You don't pay attention to your aim. You don't pay attention to your process and you screw up. And all these problems are interlinked. And if you are lapsing, that means you've lost concentration. Why'd you lose concentration? Because you weren't present in the moment. Why weren't you present? Because you didn't decide to be in the moment. And why did you decide that? Because you weren't determined to be there. You didn't have the motivation. So that all these things are really linked. I really enjoy that connection. I'm sitting there going, man, this, this is great. I remember um, Art McCarrat, who you might have seen from my videos. He was there as well. And he was like shaking his head going, this is my employer. He's just asking questions. Like, I don't know, this is amazing. So it was a really good mental training um, drill to go through all these steps and uh, understand how important and linked they were. And they were. And it all starts from that determination to go, I am going to shoot the best I can right now every single shot. So that was really fundamental to um, the mental shot process. Now, uh, he does go through a lot of um, psychology and, um, and physiology, and it, it, he, he makes links between the cause and effect of many problems which are common to all shooting uh, sports and archery especially. Uh, one thing he talks about a lot is uh, visual uh, proprioception, which is the basically hand-eye coordination. Like, our bodies um, are hardwired to act in certain ways. Um, depending on what our eyes are doing. So things like walking and balancing, pick things up. They're all linked to our brains. We know that I can reach for like this bow behind me and know exactly how far to grab and how far to move my hands because of the concept of visual proprioception. So we know where things are and our bodies will react that way. Um, and he demonstrated a few things. Uh, one thing is um, the notion of having to hold your bow steady because a lot of us try to hold our bow still with using sights or bare bow and we overcorrect and we try to hold too steady. But here's something you got to learn. So one of the things we did, we held an arrow. In this case, I'm going to hold a pen here. What you can do right now is hold a pen and I'll line it with something in front of you. I'm holding it from the camera. So you can hold it from my face or a target. But notice when you hold it up, if you look at the tip, you, you can never hold it still. So the tip will always float. But as Joel pointed out, and it's correct, every movement after it drifts will autocorrect back towards the middle. If you look at the middle of the target and the tip of the, uh, the arrow or the pen, no matter what I do or what you do, the next movement will always go back to the center. And the same thing with sights too, with the, the, the rings, it will always correct itself. Um, and those who drive cars, it's the same sort of thing. Like you don't really drive straight. You will always move side to side, but you always autocorrect because visually you are looking at the road, you're looking at the, the, arrow, the arrow point or pen point, um, and you will automatically correct. So the goal ultimately is to minimize the gap between your aim point and the desired target. Um, if you have to aim off or you're off target when you initially draw, then your body will naturally drift towards that point. And a lot of people will say, for example, draw high on target and stay high and then force them to come down. Um, and this is what I observed with my learner on the weekend, the day after was uh, he shoots bare bow, he comes to full draw, but every time he comes to full draw, he would kind of start drifting upwards like that. And I, I kind of really couldn't figure out why. He didn't know he was doing it. He, just, he didn't know why he did this. I, I, I used the same uh, mental process. Like, do you know why you did this? I have no control. You do have control. And the reason why you're doing that is because you keep on looking at the goal. Because he was shooting gap. And by shooting gap, his arrow point was below the target. Um, but his eyes would always shift towards the goal because you want the goal, your eyes want gold, it's right in the middle, it's a ring, your point's down here, you can't see the point, but you can see the gold. So the point would be down below the target, but his eyes are at, at the target. So because his eyes are above the target, he starts to naturally go up. It's unavoidable. 
it, you, your hands will go where your eyes go. You can't, okay, imagine like, you know, you're trying to grab something, but it's like behind you. Like that. <laughs> Completely unscripted. But like, you have no, it's really hard to grab things when you don't know where they are, obviously. So, if it's in front of you, you can grab it. If it's to the side, you, 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 you have no idea what you're doing. Uh, you're almost blind to it. So if it's just out of reach, it's going to be offset. And that's why my student was having trouble keeping his bow on target because his vision was linked to the gold and his body movements were linked to his vision. So uh, what um, Joel does is he really emphasizes keeping the point of the arrow as close as you can to the the center of the target uh, whether you're shooting 3d hunting animal or um, target um, that's why things like he does a lot of three under so i should split finger he maybe shoot three under to bring the arrow closer to my eye and he does acknowledge that i've got a problem i wear glasses so i can't bring it straight to eye level for closest to shooting because i hit my glasses so i i have to do things like do string walking to get that precision um on target the smaller the gap the less deviation it is. And that comes down to visual proprioception. So there were a couple of things he taught in the seminar. Um, one thing I really got out of this was the idea of the safety. Um, now the safety isn't like archery safety or bow safety. It's The safety is a concept. Like, like a firearm where you cannot discharge the firearm when the safety is on. The safety is meant to be a physical action. Not a mental one. Because mental never works. It has to be a physical um, tactile or mechanical feedback which represents a break between setting up the shot and that includes aiming and tension and then being live being ready and you can say here I go so uh, I'll show you what he taught me so um, I've got my a, a riser here just to fit on the camera um, but I, I brought my bear bow I had my uh, my horse bow my, um, my raptor actually both of those are raptors um, but I bought the two raptors and I decided to learn from bear bow that's at least training I've had on any bow style, um, from compound of course. Uh, so with my bear bow, um, I didn't really have a process. So he taught me a few basic command words to go with this. So um, the separation is I have to draw and aim. So I pick my aim point, I aim, then I tension up. So I'm at full tension when I'm at full draw. So that way there's no uh, movement. And one of the things talks about was um, if there's any like flinching, any um, collapse, it's because there's a lack of tension. And this is absolutely true. I've actually struggled with back tension a lot, um, especially shooting bare bow. I shoot a big recurve, which is driven by a clicker, so I can focus on expansion. But without a clicker, I do tend to collapse uh, on both thumb draw and um, bare bow. So this is a really good observation. And the reason why it's collapsed is because there's and there's 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 um slack in the range of motion. It means I'm not fully tense. If I'm fully tense, I wouldn't collapse. If I am just partially not tense, I am going to leak with my tension. So I've got to make sure I'm at my maximum tension. My shoulder blades are fully out there. And when I had a spotter watch me and tell me, "Hey, push your shoulder out," and when I did it, it felt like a clean shot. So. These are the technical things, which again, back tension is back tension. Um, but the point was that with the safety, you get these things right before you shoot. You don't shoot with a partial draw with partial tension. So you need to have something which you activate before you allow yourself to continue. So in my case, what he did was he said, well, how many things do you shoot with on the riser? And uh, you know, some people shoot with one, some with two, I shoot with two. And he said, when I put a, put a third finger on, so I've got a third finger. You can do two, you can do three. So there's three fingers. And then he said, when you um, get to your tension, so you aim and you apply tension, then take the safety off. Now, this explains a lot of what people do with trout shooting. There are some um, uh, mannerisms which people have, and I understand this particular one now. So this is a sign where I'm not going to let go until I get the tension right, and then tension off and then I'm ready to go. I can say here I go or go and I'm fully focused on doing the shot. My eyes are focused on the target, I'm aiming there, I'm fully tense, safety is off, I'm now free to shoot. So it's kind of my go word after I do that. So that was quite cool. Um, I tried it and I started feeling a lot more confident in my shot because 
the anxiety that comes with getting everything right is gone because you're not thinking of too many things at once. Now, it doesn't make me a perfect shot, and that's something different, but um, it did make it a lot easier for me to mentally focus on the one thing it had to do. Um, so that was really effective. Uh, and he said, look, there are other things you can do. Like, if you don't want to remove your fingers or something, it can be something like uh, tapping your foot or moving your, squeezing your big toe. Um, for thumb shooters, we can't move our fingers, so it might be um, like blowing a bubble in your cheek, and then when it goes off, your safety is off. Uh, and there are others. He observed um, other archers where some might, for example, blink like three times before they shoot. Um, they might like tap their nose with a string a few times. Basically anything to separate um, the first part of the process where they set up the shot and had the tension and then the shot itself. So by having that step, it gives you that determination and decision making to proceed to the next step. Um, and by the way, I should point out that with presence, you know, it's all about mindfulness. So you are always mindful, not always like uh, overthinking, but you're conscious and you're mindful of what you were doing. Hence why this is quite important. I'm not passively drawing until I let go. I'm drawing until I'm ready to decide to let go to the next step and so on. That's the whole idea of the process. Now, something else he taught was the seer. So the safety is uh, a barrier to stop you from shooting before, you to, uh, before you're ready. Um, the seer is meant to be a surprise. Now, uh, okay, he's a, he's a, you know, he shoots firearms, so this is like when this trick surprises you. Art is a little different because depending on your style you and your release, you might not have that uh, capacity to be surprised. Now, with a uh, compound, this is the classic punch in the trigger symptom where you anticipate when it should go off, therefore you force it. Um, I know people who shoot with um, the uh, thumb trigger or index trigger, they'll punch it. They'll go, all right, squeeze, squeeze, punch. Um, or even with the, the, the back tension, they'll just force it. Now they, they know it's coming that they force it open. So the principle behind this here is that it's meant to be a surprise result. And again, if you're shooting fingers, how do you make this a surprise? You can't really make it a surprise. Um, clicker, the, the closed trigger systems, it's almost ingrained. You go, click, go. All right, that, that's how easy it is to shoot recurve, Olympic. Is it, it clicks, you go, and it's very simple. Um, but for things which don't have an inbuilt mechanical trigger, how do you simulate that surprise? Um, and he, he refers to mechanoreceptors, basically tactile feedback. Um, so having a way in which you physically wire yourself, you program yourself to only release when something like happens. Um, so the example we showed, and we'll show the video of him shooting my my my, uh, my Asiatic recurve. He shot a thumb draw, and his thumb leather thumb ring is designed so that there are um, a couple of brass knobs. And what he does is he will come to full draw. And then he'll use um, his finger to push against one of the uh, heads of the, uh, the screws until it slips off. And as soon as it slips off, he releases. So with a program action, it's a program action where when something goes off, he goes off. And it has to be physical. It can't be mental. You can't go click, bang, because you're anticipating something happening. It doesn't come as a surprise anymore. So um, that was something which was, was interesting. Now, this is something mostly for compound we found. Um, he modified his thumb ring to work for thumb draw. Um, and uh, you can see him shoot. Like, it's very, very controlled. And his release is clean and mechanical and purposeful. Very deliberate, which is nice to see. That's the seer. Something which helps you be surprised by the shot and therefore not anticipate it. A um, couple of things you mentioned, uh, things about being present, of course, and concentration. A big part is self-talk. Uh, I coach this a lot in my shooting as well, is use command words. In my case, I say command words, like do it. Um, I was trained with the KSL process, so uh, it's like you say, you know, draw, anchor, transfer, hold, that sort of thing. So you have to say it out loud. You know, when I lived with Coach Lee, we stood in a room with stretching band and we shouted them out and we didn't care. We, we had to do it properly. Um, what I find is when people internalize it, and you can internalize command words as long as you can hear it, but a lot of people don't even internalize command words. They just autopilot. 
and I've seen this in every person I've taught. When I when I tell them as a coach what to do, I stand behind them and go draw, anchor. Blah, blah, blah. They'll do it correct. They'll shoot fine. Even though I'm not following a formal process, it might just be like okay, gold, go, and do the same thing because that they're 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 shooting. Their 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 technique is good, but they're mentally collapsing. So I am their mental crutch. I will tell them what to do. So the moment I say gold, they might put the arrow on gold. I say go. And they release, and it's always a gold. When I stop saying that, they stop hitting golds. They just collapse, and I keep telling them, "Say it to yourself, I'm not always going to be there. Say it to yourself, say gold, say go, and they shoot fine. The moment they stop saying it, they shoot poorly. And you ask, well, why shoot poorly? I didn't say it. Now say it, and they shoot well. And this is such. I think one of the biggest traps in learners. I think we mentioned later on too is how a lot of people just simply don't have the mental process. They have the physical form, but not the mental process and the mental discipline to do things like self talk. And as a result, you often get the autopilot syndrome where you shoot, but you weren't paying attention to what you were doing, and that causes all the problems uh, in falling apart. Now, I think the most important thing in the whole thing was the blueprint, and that is you have to. Know what you are doing. That's why at the very beginning of the workshop, he explained、um, how or asked how do you do it. Doesn't matter what you do, how you doing it, and this is really how. It's like what did you do to get yourself to make the decision to do what you did, and it has to be a blueprint. It must be something you copy for every single shot you do. Hence the photocopier.、Uh, that's a, I don't know why I didn't choose this one. That's PowerPoint did this, but I think it's very appropriate. You have to be able to copy your shot. I'm a teacher. This is cheese for me.、Um, but you have to copy it. So once you know what the words are that you use to trigger yourself, what the safety is, blueprint it. So you do it every single time. For me, I, I blueprinted it. You know, I, I learned what he taught me.、Um, he didn't tell me exactly how to do it. He just gave me a suggestion. I can modify it. But basically, have your three fingers safety, safety off. So it was aim, tension, safety off, and then here we go. Whatever it is you do, make sure you copy it. You write it down. You mentally copy it. So every shot has this process. Hence the blueprint. So, for that said, one of my final thoughts on shot IQ. And again, this is a very watered down version summary, very quick.、Um, you, you get far more from this from the course and in person. But one of my thoughts of shot IQ. What, what do I think of it?、Um, I think very positively. Firstly, I think Joel was a great presenter.、Um, the way he carries himself as a person, and I had the opportunity to have a chat with him afterwards to have dinner.、Um, really great, determined mind. I, I, I felt a lot coming from him as a person. That alone is an archer. It's just really good to see someone speak with that sort of confidence and、um, that determination, which rubs off other people. So him being there in person really made a difference. I think the shot IQ process is a very powerful mental process.、Um, even just applying it to a simple way, I I found it very beneficial to just have that determination. I mean, like for the last three days, I've been thinking about everything, like applying the whole. Do it as if your life depend on it on every single thing. Like I did things like writing tests or、uh, teaching in classroom. I carry myself differently,、um, having that mental process in the back of my mind. So I think it was really healthy and a nice timing for me to kind of get off my my lazy, you know, make excuses to myself and start doing things like they matter.、Um, and I think it, I, we, we discussed this later afterwards, but. I think it's quite crucial that we teach mental process really early. Like we don't teach mental process at all in some cases. Like we teach physical process, like shot process first, mental process a distant second, if at all. And that's something which I think Joel mentioned was you, you, you've got to do this early. This should be the first thing you teach. Now, how you do this, I don't know. Well, that's something which most training programs don't do. But mental process is neglected. I see this in my coaching in my club when I see people shoot. Is that six months people just collapse? Like you, you improve rapidly, and after six months it just stops, and people start quitting the quitting the sport, stop training. They feel like they fit a barrier because this is the form that's deficient in most cases. It's there's a lack of mental process. There's no discipline, no persistence, no determination, which creates all the problems which we discussed earlier.、Um, I think that this. Uh, method applies to a lot of different styles.、Uh, like we said, we had、um, 
our, our, our thumb draw shooters we had uh bearbow we had compound we had olympic ray curve it really fit to um every style that we had and it was quite adaptable and it gave us a lot of room for interpretation the main thing being the mental determination presence and concentration so again everyone tried it and it, 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 it it's applicable to everybody now what i found a little difficult um was that if you already have a, an imprinted process uh, for example again with nts or ksl we do call out the shots already we call you know draw anchor hold transfer expand follow through reflection and you know, that sort of thing so you already have these trigger words so because he'll introduce trigger words like things like safety tension up you have to kind of link these words together. And he said, and in the workshop, he would say that if you already have trigger words or a mantra, um, in, in our case, because we're talking about um, Ottoman and Arab archery, um, they already have a mental process. In our case, it was, we'll say, Ya Allah, uh, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, or uh, Bismillah, Ya Haq, uh, as our three shot process. Um, and that's a mantra which. Uh, he knows this. He knows they've been using mantras for centuries, uh, and that can definitely work as long as it's linked to uh, positive action. If you're just saying it and not actually following it, that's something different. So, it, 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 I found that if you already have something in mind, you have to kind of make the connection and make it work. Um, the last thing is this is really meant to be turning you into the most concentrated precise shooter you can possibly be um it really emphasizes marksmanship so uh that's why he'll convert me from shooting split finger to three under it just brings the arrow close to the eye narrows the gap and that makes sense the less gap there is the more accurate your shooting will be the more you have to guess the worse it is both mentally guessing and physically guessing now this might um contradict um styles where you have to shoot split finger so if you shoot like instinctive longbow you can't string walk um and likewise for styles which are inherently meant to be instinctive like horse archery or traditional archery this might be a little hard to kind of um blend together um ultimately like i said before his goal is if you don't have an excuse to not shoot precisely like if you're shooting horse archery style but you're on foot Yes, you can shoot horse archery style and just shoot instinctively, but if you're trying to actually be precise and you don't have to be on a horse, then should you adopt a more focused, precise mental model? That's kind of what's challenging there. So people who want you just want to be instinctive, just want to fling arrows, might find it hard to grasp because this really pushes that determination. You can shoot precisely and therefore you should. Um, now that's kind of my rough summary of things. So uh, overall, was it worth it? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. That was fun. Um, it was nice to meet people, nice to meet Joel. I think he was a great person to talk to. Um, I think he is what he is. Uh, he, definitely the real thing. Um, you know, if you've listened to my podcast and you're really swayed by the way he speaks and what he presents, um, very much legitimately what is real, real life as well. Um, so it was a real pleasure to meet Joel. Um, I learned a lot from the session. Definitely worth the price. Uh, if anything, like these things are... Um, great life changes in terms of how you approach um, life through archery and through these life lessons. Um, but I also found it uh, worthwhile because uh, one of the most important things you can invest in as an archer is education. Um, you can buy the best bow, but, bow, but if you never learn how to shoot, then you know, it's a lost cause. Um, if you never get coaching, then there's only so much you can do. Um, a lot of people are reluctant to, you know, pay for coaching or listen to somebody else speak or, you know, they know what we're talking about and you want to figure it on yourself. There's a, there's, a, there's a big ego thing where I, I want to do it by myself. I want to be good, but I don't want to be taught. I want to figure it by myself. Well, you can, but, you know, as you learn from Shot IQ, the more you leave the chance, the less precise it will be. So um, whether it's Shot IQ or some other coaching course or real life coach, Definitely look up reliable presenters and coaches who you can definitely learn from uh, because that investment is worth more than any bow that you can buy. Um, anyway, I hope you find this interesting. Again, this is very summarized. I know it's a long video, but it's my summarized thoughts. Hopefully you listen and learn something. Again, if you were part of the Shot IQ seminar or course at some point, do post your thoughts below about what you learned because I'm quite curious if we corroborate. Um, I find it interesting. I enjoyed it. Uh, and hopefully, if you get a chance to do this sort of thing yourself in the future, then uh, definitely consider it. 
um, and uh, do share what you learned. Anyway, thanks for watching, people. Um, sorry for the long video, but hopefully that was beneficial, and again, hopefully we'll see you next time.